Breakout sessions, good? Cool. Hey, uh, food's been pretty good for camp food. Yeah, all 12 of you agree with me. Um, did anybody try the dessert either or today? They were okay. They were not. They were not great. I uh, I made myself a coke float tonight. Um, so all of you can be jealous of my dessert. Um, but as we talk about food for the next 20 seconds, um, you ever like drop some on the floor? Yeah. Isn't that so sad? I mean, obviously, like, the five-second rule is a thing. But, um, you ever see those videos of, like, the kids, like, with the ice cream cone, and then, like, the whole ice cream just falls out of the cone, and that's, like, oh, that's tough. Um, just to ensure that you guys are awake tonight, the other thing that goes good with ice cream, typically around birthdays, is, hey, um, and in some ways, like, while dropping ice cream is really sad, dropping cake is really funny. So I've got about one minute of that video that we're going to play for everybody of just people dropping cake. So check out the screens. Should be in there, Cade. <clears throat> Which category we fit in about how everyone's an insider. But this, this sets the, 
to set the scene for who Jesus is talking to because he wants these people, these Pharisees, these religious leaders to understand a little bit more about the heart of God. He wants these religious elite who are, who are off the side of observing, judging other people to understand that they desperately need what the Father is offering. So here we go. We're going we're to start in verse 11. We're going to read through verse 24. So we're going to read the whole section and we're going to backtrack. But hopefully you've got your Bible turned there. It says this, because we've, we've already looked at the sheep, we've already looked at the coin, but it says Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country there, squandered his wealth, and squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Verse 15. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So I'm going to start there, stop right there in verse 19. We'll look, we'll look at the other verses here in just a minute. But tonight our focus is on the younger son. Tomorrow we're going to finish Luke 15. We're going to look at the older brother. What I love about this story, we tend to focus our attention on the younger son who leaves home. That's exactly what we're going to do tonight. So Jesus is trying to teach us something about the older son that we'll look at tomorrow. But the younger son, there are two movements that happen in the younger son's life. Two movements that happen in the younger son's life. The first is that he leaves. That's the first movement. The younger son leaves. That's the first movement of the younger son's life. The leaving happens in verse 12. When the younger of these two sons says to his father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. He is asking for his inheritance. Now, typically, when we think about this, this is give me Everything that you own. Typically that happens when the parent dies. But I want you to understand how big of a request he is asking. He says, yes, I know you're still alive. Give me everything that you own that is rightfully mine. When you die, I want it right now. Can you imagine how bold of a, of a request that is? Can you imagine going up to your own parent and saying, hey, uh, I know you're alive right now, but give me everything. Write the will right now. Give me the house. Give me the car. Give me everything. It says that he divides it up amongst them. And that's, that's, that's a pretty crazy ask. He's, he would not get this stuff until his father died. And this would be shocking for even the listeners that were gathered around Jesus, as it should be for us. And the other son is just saying, I wish you were dead. Give me what is mine and give it to me now. It's pretty intense. It's so much more than just this greedy son who's in a hurry to get to the fun part of life. And I would imagine, if you, if you can remember the scene here, all of these people are listening to Jesus share this part of the story. And every single one of them is probably like, oh, he said what to his dad? You know, somebody's probably in the room like, oh, that kid's going to get it. <laughs> like it. But what's even more shocking than the request is that the father complies. He gives it to him. And the way that this is truly felt in the Greek, which is, this is the language of the New Testament is written in, the Greek word uses it here for property is, is bios, which means life. Biology, right? So we kind of get that phrase. The, 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 father, the father literally divides his entire life between his, between his two sons. It's humiliating for the father because he's having to basically decide, okay, my, I'm, my, my son says I'm dead to him now. 
and it's shocking, and it only gets worse. So, so the, it's not just that the son is greedy. Well, we should write this down because it's not on the screen. The son rejects his father. He takes from his father, and then he rejects from his father. The father who gives him so much of himself. And then the son proceeds to not only say thank you, but he rejects it. This gracious, generous father. Gives him freely. And then the son rejects it. I think sometimes we read the, the parable of the father and son. We're like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in a hurry too. Like, I'm not crazy about the curfew that my parents have. I'm not crazy about the fact that I don't have a cell phone yet. Or I'm not really crazy about the fact that there are rules. I, it would be great if I lived by, you know, by my own rules in my own house. I could make my own decisions. I could watch as much TV as I want to watch. I, 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 I think we all can get that. But I want you to understand how far the prodigal son goes beyond just our natural desire to want to be in control. He goes so much to the point of control where he says... Peace out, Dad. I'm done with you. You're dead to me. Can you imagine how intense that is? It's not just, hey, empty out the bank account. I'm going to go have some fun in the big city. He rejects his father. Now, remember, this is a parable, so you know where we're going with this. But in verse 13, this is where it gets worse. It says that we're told a few days later, Son takes off for a distant land where he squanders his property, his vitals, his father's life in reckless living. He squanders everything. His father divided up everything. I was trying to think of an illustration for this, and I really couldn't think of one that would fit appropriate. But I want you to think about maybe what is most important, what physical thing maybe is most important to your parents. It, 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 obviously, at the end of the day, it's you. <laughs> but if you're talking about maybe a material item, maybe it's an autograph, maybe it's a... You can see where this breaks down, obviously. Maybe it's maybe it's a certain picture. Maybe it's like your your dad has some really cool, like, World War II memorabilia. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that's really meaningful. And in the same way, you, you just throw... If you, you were to just take that thing that... that Yes, it's a worldly item that they cherish most. They give it to you because he loves you, even though you're going to reject him. And you just throw it in the dumpster. You throw the Civil War sword in the dumpster. You throw the autographed basketball in the dumpster. <laughs> Squanders it. He got his inheritance and he bolted. Check out, check out the language. He said, underline it. He squandered, recklessly squandered it. If you look up the definition of the word prodigal, you'll find that, that, that a, a definition of a prodigal is, is a recklessly spendthrift. Somebody that just is out here living it up. And not just in the sense of negative. Some people that it's lavish. Either prodigal son. Is lavish, but we're also going to see a little bit about how the father is also lavish. The younger son leaves home, he leaves his father, he recklessly squanders everything. And here's what I want you to understand tonight because as he recklessly pursues the world, he says, You know what? My father doesn't have anything to offer me besides his inheritance. I'm going to reject him and go and do my own thing. We know that to be sin. But what I want you to understand is any time we try to find our happiness or, or, or our identity in anything outside of God, we leave home. We leave the Father. We, 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 we reject the Father. And don't get it twisted. You and I, we are the prodigal son.
And if you're trying to hype yourself up that you're the older brother and you're the type of brother, you're going to stay home and get ready for a while. Because he's no better. But when we talk about rejecting the Father, this is something that we all do. We've abandoned our Father. We've rejected Him. We say, I want nothing to do with you. Because I want to find my fulfillment in something else. We leave, we reject, we abandon, we turn our back on, we betray. It's a it's a it's backstabbing. Do not sugarcoat this. Somebody who loves you so much and you say, I'm done with you. I wish I could use another word. But that's the attitude of the prodigal son here. And what we do when we do this, we this movement away from the Father, when we leave, it is a movement towards a life of emptiness. That's the first movement. Leaving, we, we, we buy into the lie that when we leave, we're going to find something else that's going to fulfill. Sit up for a minute. I know you're tired, and I know it's warm in here. But do the best you can to kind of sit up. Okay? We're, we're, we're doing just fine. But you may need to elbow your neighbor if you need to. But this story gets so much better. So I need you to lean in for me. Okay? I know you know this story before. You've heard it. But we see that the younger son begins to understand this, this emptiness in verses 14 through 16. We see that he spends all of his money. Of course he does. It's like every middle school boy that's ever been on a camp trip before with us. They spend all their money in the first two days. That's why we got rid of the mall shopping day at high school camp. Yeah. But check out what verse 17 says. He finally comes to his senses. He is, he is chilling in the mud. Right? Spin everything. He's chilling in the mud. He's like, you know what? All of my dad's servants, all the people that work for him, they eat better than this. Because he's about to eat pig slop. Anybody in here like a farmer or know what pig slop is? Pig slop's pretty gross. I agree. It's pretty nasty. Like, pigs are gross as is, right? They are. And you are what you eat, right? Like, he's considering getting ready to eat the pig slop, and he said, like, I'm starving. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm, 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 my dad, he. He's not. He, he, he's probably super ticked at me because I've rejected him. It's not like. It's not like. Oh, well, I can just be like, hey, um, I'll Venmo you when I can. Like it's not like that. It's you know. It's like I said I'm done with you, and now I'm kind of like backtracking a little bit. Oh man, um, we're in a little pickle here, right? And he, he legitimately has nowhere to go except to go back home. And that's the one place that he said, I'm never coming back here again. And notice this. He's not even trying to reclaim his status as a son. He knew what he had done. He understood that his culture would, would never be able to reclaim his place as his father's son. There's actually a ceremony in Jewish culture for this exact scenario. If a Jewish son lost his inheritance to the Gentiles, this is before both Jews and Gentiles were both included and in, in, after Jesus' death. At this point, when if Jews lost their inheritance to Gentiles, he would face something known as the Kazaza. I'm not making this word up. It sounds like kazoo, but it's Kazaza. If you want to write it up in your notes, if you're the type of person that wants to spell it right, it's K-E-Z-A-Z-A-H. K-E-Z-A-Z-A-H. What that means, it means the cutting off. You are cut off. And what they do, what they do in the ceremony in Jewish culture, say you you squandered your inheritance, not only that, you didn't lose it to Jews, you lost it to the to the Gentiles, who are unclean people groups. They would break a clay pot at the at the child's feet and says, you know what? 
Permanent rejection. We talk about that in modern day culture. It's breaking the plate when you turn 18. This means you can't move into your mom and dad's basement when you graduate high school. But in the same way in Jewish culture, they break the pot and they say, you're done here. You're dead to us. You're, 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 you're cut out. You're on your own. Because I was out. And the younger son would have known this. The audience would have known this. But his condition right now is so desolate. It's so bad that he would rather be a servant to somebody that he has said, I reject you, than to starve. So when he's, look at what he starts to do. He starts to practice his speech. You've seen press conferences where there's the apology letter or the apology statement. He's, he's rehearsing. You know, when I was a teenager, when I, when I was 16, I started to drive places. We, we would have conversations about curfew. Because I, I didn't believe the fact that they said nothing good happens after 11. I didn't buy it. I'm like, well, we, we seem to have fun. And we're just different than the other people that make bad choices, Mom or Dad. And, and there would be times, because they were pretty strict about it. They, 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 they had my best interest at heart. I didn't believe it at the time, but it's true. There would be times, and I can't tell you how many times I would practice my speech on the way home, trying to come up with some sort of excuse as to why I was late. Oh, traffic was bad. I hit every red light between here and the Van Drive Starbucks. I don't know what happened. It was the craziest thing. <laughs> or I would legitimately lie about where I was. Before you start judging, <laughs> and, and they they they, they be weighing up. But what started out was that they would watch a movie. It turned into you need to come into our bedroom and tell us that you're home. And usually I was like, well, maybe she'll be half asleep. Mamas know, y'all. <laughs> like they just know. And, and so I would roll in there and I would say, hey, um. Like that, that was literally how it would go, and I would close the door, and, and then the next morning, it's like, hey, so when you got home at about 12, 15, did you think that was going to work on you? And I would rehearse these speeches. I can remember driving home, and I would rehearse these speeches. That's exactly what the prodigal son is doing. He's rehearsing his speech. And when I get to my dad, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and, and, I, and I know it's going to be ugly, and he's probably going to be mad at me, so what I'll do is I'll just, you can see him pacing, you know, I'll just be one of the slaves. I'll, 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 I'll work in the barn, I'll sleep in the barn, but I can maybe show up at mealtime every once in a while. He's not, he's not going to be happy with me. He's, they've already done the kazaza, they've already broken the pot. Can't you just see how the wheels are turning for this guy? And so as he practices his speech, the second movement begins. Remember what movement one is, is that he left. The second movement is that he begins, he returns. He returns. And this is where the story starts to get wild. Look in your Bibles in verse 20. It says, so he got up and went to his father. And while he was still a long way off, oh, this is so good. His father saw him and was filled with with compassion for him. Underline it, highlight it, circle it, bold it. He saw him. If he's a long way off, what does that communicate about the father? He was looking. Okay, he hadn't moved on from life. It wasn't just saying, my, my son is, has rejected me and, and so he's never coming home. Every single day, his father is sitting by the bedroom window or the kitchen window and saying, God, when he comes back today. And up over the hill, there he is. There he is. There's my, there's my boy. There's my boy. He's out there. And he's filled with compassion. And it says this. I want you to just underline the circle this next part. It says that he ran to his son. We'll talk about that in just a minute. He ran to his son. He said, his arms around him and he kissed him and the son said to him father I've sinned against heaven 
and against you, and, he, and he's starting his speech. Great start, right? If you're guilty, great start to his speech. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The groveling has started. Everything that he has rehearsed up until this point. Hey, I messed up. I messed up. I messed up. You know, maybe drop to the knee at some point. Maybe some crocodile tears if you need you on the spot to just maybe get your father's good graces a little bit. But the father doesn't even let him finish his speech. The father says, ah, uh, uh, quick, servants, bring, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now was found. And they began to celebrate. What? The, 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 dad, the, the son who literally said, forget you. The dad says, I, I, I've never forgotten you. You forgot me, but I never forgot you. That's just who our father is. Even when we forget him, he never forgets us. This is the biggest moment of shock so far in the story. Everybody that was reading the story was like, oh, oh, oh we're <laughs> Yeah, he's, 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 I can roll with the son's speech. That makes sense. Because that, that makes sense for the audience that he's talking to. It, it, it's bigger than when the son wished his father was dead and requests his inheritance. It's bigger than when the father humiliates himself by actually giving it to him. And Jesus' listeners would have been expecting the Kazaza. But instead, what does the father do after he sees him and after he's filled with compassion? After the circle, what does he do? He ran. Let me talk to you about Jewish culture for a second. Middle Eastern men don't run. They don't. It's just, it's just, that's, that's for commoners to do. That's for slaves to do. But if you're an established Jewish man, you don't run. It's, it's, it's not manly. It's not gentlemanlike. If you think about proper culture and proper ways to act, Middle Eastern men don't run. That's beneath them. But this father does not care. He doesn't care what he's going to look like to his servants. Because if a Jewish man that's of status is, is, is running, either there's a bear behind him, or he just wants to look like an idiot. But look at what the father does. This Jewish patriarch would never run in public. He runs to his son. He hugs him. He kisses him. Yeah, he wasn't waiting on the couch to ground him. Verse 21, the younger son started to give his speech that he rehearsed. The father ignores it. He calls his servants. He says, I bring him the best robe and the fattened calf. We must celebrate, the father said, for this son, for my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost. And it's found. And in this moment, the word prodigal, which means wrecked and spinster, can now be used to describe the Father's grace. But not only do we see in this story that there is a prodigal son, we also see in this story that there is a prodigal father. We see that in the same way where the, where the son recklessly spins his father's inheritance, the father recklessly spins love. Recklessly spins Grace. Even before the son can get his whole apology out, he stops him. Tim Keller writes in, this, in the book Product of God. He writes this. He says, This demonstrates the lavish prodigality of God's grace. Jesus shows the father counting on his son in love, not only before he has a chance to clean up his life and evidence of a change of heart, but even before he can recite the repentance speech. Nothing, not even. Abject contrition, which what that piece of means is a really good apology, merits the favor of God. The Father's love and acceptance are absolutely free. Still, in Kilo writes that we see that even before the Son gets his apology, the Father embraces him. The Father already knows the Son is sorry because he's been he walked up their main street. He's in the driveway. Father knows what the son did. He, it's not like he forgot the conversation where the son rejected him. But even still, the father is simply glad that his son has returned home. This grace, forgiveness. This is the grace and forgiveness, love of our heavenly father. 
You guys know who Rembrandt is? Anybody in art history class here? Okay, if you're not an art person, this is kind of like, Rembrandt's kind of like a Da Vinci dude. Okay, same general category. Okay, he paints this picture that tries to illustrate the return of a prodigal son. It's probably one of those really expensive, notorious paintings, kind of Mona Lisa scale that, that, that a lot of people care about. But I want to show it to you. If you're on the back row, you're not going to be able to see it well, and that's okay. But we got it in there, okay? Okay, here it is. And what Rembrandt's doing is he's painting, kind of, he's, he's painting a picture of, I know it's hard for you to see, but you got, you got son here who's already kind of rehearsed his speech. He's got one, he's got one, like basically half a shoe on his right foot. Father's there and then the rest of of the house is there. We'll also talk about this picture tomorrow. But we see the younger son, his head's completely shaven. He's wearing tattered rags side of the sleigh. One sandal's broken, the other's completely falling off. The young man's wasted everything. He's, he's broken, he's unworthy of his father's love. He, he, his father didn't have to give him the time of day at this point. And yet here he is, he is resting in the arms of his loving father. Look at his posture. You ever hug anybody sitting down? Kind of a weird thing to do. But he paints that picture because if you're hugging somebody while you're sitting down, you were like very vulnerable in that moment. You're just like, okay, we're going to, okay, this is how we're going to, you know? We see here that this son just kind of knelt at his feet and he's home and he's found grace and he's found forgiveness and he's found love and he's found rest. And but it's, I want you to imagine yourself as the person in the tattered rags. You can leave it up there, Katie. I want you to imagine yourself for a second. Because I think a lot of the times we have this moment. We have this moment. Some of you have experienced this moment where you're saying, you know what, I ran to the Father and I experienced grace and forgiveness and I, and I had this moment. And then what happens is we become like the guy on the far right and say, yeah, that thing happened to me, but I forgot about it. Some of you fall into that category where you forget about God's grace. Some of you in the room tonight, we're going to talk about it just a minute, have never experienced it. And that's okay. But that's, that's something that he wants for you. He wants you to return home. Maybe not. you need to run to the Father. Maybe it's for the first time ever. Or maybe you need to return home. You've been, you've been way off the deep end. You've told, the, you've told God, forget you. I want to date who I want to date. I want to, I want to vape when I want to vape. I want to do whatever I want to do. It's not going to hurt anybody else because it's me doing me. I'm telling you, if you run away from home, emptiness is going to be there to follow. Middle schoolers in the room, you're going to get more choices when you get to high school. High schoolers in the room, you're in the middle of it right now. You have a million different choices to make every single day. And you get to choose if you're going to make good ones or bad ones. I want to ask you, are, where are you searching for your fulfillment? Do you need to find some rest? Do you need to get out of the, the pig? The, the mud and the mire, are you, are you hurting? Are you tired? Are you broken? Are you already rehearsing your speech? Where do you find your fulfillment? Is it in relationships? Is it in popularity? Are you just doing other stuff because other people think it's cool? Are you just trying to be a great student or a great athlete and, and that has become God? Granted, there's nothing wrong with doing well in sports. There's nothing wrong with it. I love playing sports. I like winning just as much as everybody else. But for whatever reason, we allow these other things in life. God is not going to ask you what your GPA was, and he's not going to ask you how many trophies you have when you see him face to face one day. He's not going to ask you that. 
He's just not. He's not going to ask you if you went D1. I used to bother me so much. I, I played D3. None of y'all came. But if I was 17 years old, I would have told every single one of you, guess what? I, I committed to D1, which I did. And then I decommitted to D1. But it was going to be the biggest status thing in the world. Guess what? I got all this Nike stuff. I'm a bad dude. I'm a state champion. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an all American all state, all conference. I've got all these accolades. Guess where they all are right now? They're in a box in our attic. It is what it is. I don't decorate anymore. But at one point, I cared more about all those accomplishments than what Christ accomplished for me on the cross. And I lost sight of it. At one point, the girl that I was dating, it was not her, was more important than anything else. I find it very hard to date in high school and to grow in your relationship with Jesus because you're only going to pick one. I, I would love you enough to tell you that. If you're, if you're capable of, of, of growing in your relationship with Jesus in high school and growing in a relationship with a significant other, you're superhuman. I'll, I'll, there may be some college students in there who are like, oh. <laughs> but I say all of that to say this. You have got to ask yourself legitimately, where are you finding your fulfillment? Be so real about this. Do, do, the, do the deep dive and examine your life. Where are you finding your fulfillment? At the end of the day, are you saying, forget you, God? Because it, 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 it feels like a slow fade, doesn't it? Like nobody's going to be like, well, no, I don't you know. Me and God, look, God's proud of me. Well, yes, he is. But oftentimes, I, I, I find myself, or we find ourselves, when we're more proud of what we've accomplished than what Christ has accomplished for us. We get, we get it twisted. I want you to understand something. This is, this is where we mess up. Because we, we mess up either so bad that, that we become the, the star character, or we mess up so bad that we assume that God's never going to let me back in. And we start rehearsing our speeches. <clears throat> you look at pornography again, and it feels like the millionth time. You're like, okay, all right, God, this time, I promise I'm not going to do it anymore. Or maybe for you, oh, this time, I'm, I'm going to stop cussing. I'm going to stop vaping. I'm going to stop. I, 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 I've got a little power. I'm going to quit cold turkey. I, I'm going to stop. And time and time again, you squander it and you waste your chance. You squander it and you waste your chance. You squander it and you waste your chance. And there's one thing that you're still doing. Can you imagine if the guy, <laughs> the young son, is like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep trying harder and harder and harder, and I'm never gonna go home. I'm gonna keep trying to make it in Gentile country, but I'm never gonna go home. Can you imagine how many times the prodigal son was like, you know what, I can't go back here. I'm going to have to figure out something else. I've messed up too bad. I've made too many mistakes that I can't go back there. I, I know what I said to my dad. My dad knows what I said to him. I can't go back there. I can't look him in the eye again because I've blown it. John Acuff writes a an article about this very story and this very posture about the prodigal son. I want to read it to you. And I hope everybody's still awake. But I, and it's a little bit of a lengthy article, but it's, it's, it's worth it. Because I hope it paints a picture of what the story really means for us. And this is what he writes. He says that it was, it was summer at the time, and it, there's a story that he loves to tell about himself and Michael Jordan. And it's, 
It's a, it's a story where at one time John A. Cup, he's this famous Christian author, he, he meets Michael Jordan one summer while he's working at a country club in Pinehurst, North Carolina. John Acuff's uncle and his family, they lived on a golf course. He was spending a couple weeks there before he started the eighth grade. And this is while, while Jordan's superhuman at this point. And he, he's not only there that day by himself playing golf, guess who also there? Dean Smith and Dr. J. Both of these guys are there on the golf course and he's, he's going nuts. And so he finds this, this marker and he's like, MJ, MJ, sign the back of my shirt. Sign, sign the back of my shirt. And he gets Dr. J and he gets Dean Smith. Hey, sign the back of my shirt. You guys are legends. And he realizes, you know what? I signed the back of my shirt because that's all I had at the time. I'm going to go back to the clubhouse and I'm going to fold that shirt, put it in my safe, put it in a drawer. But I'm going to get him to sign that maybe a piece of paper so I'm not going to frame. And so he waits for the ground to end and Michael Jordan and Dr. J, they're all coming back to the clubhouse. And he, he says, oh, I. There he is, there he is. And so he brings, he brings the paper and he says, excuse me, Mr. Jordan, can I have your, your autograph? I, I want to get it signed. And, and, he, and it says this, he says, with, with, with the look that froze most opponents on the basketball court, he said, Did, didn't I already sign you, kid? Didn't I already give you an autograph? Crushed him. See, in the real world, he says this, he says, in parking lots like Pinehurst, North Carolina, life is limited. Your hero turns to you and tells you that he's not going to give you another autograph. Your hero tells you that he remembers you and you're not getting a second signature, which was the only thing you wanted that day. Sometimes I think God is like that. Bothered by me, tired of my requests for his time. Even if it's just three seconds for him to sign off on some prayer that, that I'm saying or need that I, that I think that I can't live without. And God's on his way somewhere in Porto with after a round of golf with Moses and Elijah and Elisha. And, and he's chasing God. We're chasing God down in the parking lot. He turns with his big God golf clubs and he looks down at me and he says in that massive voice of his, didn't I already forgive you, kid? See, forgiveness is the thing that I ask for most. And in my head, maybe I know that God's forgiveness is eternal and inexhaustible, but in my heart, I feel like he's going to run out. It's like you got like a limited supply, and I'm just burning up those chances one after the other, sin by sin. I keep blowing it. He says, I've read the story about the prodigal son more than anything else in the Bible. If you've messed up in life like I have, then it's a pretty good read, which we just did. It's part of the reason I've read that story so many times, though, is that I think that there's something missing. I feel like there's some verse or passage that I must have skipped that makes the whole thing make sense. It seems too good to be true. See, John knows about the kazaza. He knows about the rejection that's taking place. He knows that the prophecy takes an inheritance, that he blows it on fast living, that he ends up in the big bed, and then all of a sudden he gets a party thrown for him when he returns home. What? He says, no, 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 no. Oh, this is what I imagine the day after the party. This is what should have gone on. He says, the first rays of sunshine crept across the floor and landed on a pile of party papers being swept up by a servant. A local home banner was being taken down and across the house the sounds of the morning reverberated. In his old bedroom, the prodigal son rolls over and he opens his eyes. He dreamt of it so often, dreamt of this place so often, he couldn't believe it was real. Those nights in the dark, the curl under a bush or beside the barn where his money was gone, his hope with it, he wondered if he'd ever know safe. And he sat up and he's surprised to find himself there laughing at the memories of the night before, the feast, the party, the ridiculousness of it all. His family who celebrated his return as his absence has increased their love for him and confided. None of it made any sense. Then there was a knock on the door. He had a door again. That was something he had missed. He was in the head of the servant peeks in and he says, Sir, your father is waiting for you in the kitchen. So with a yawn and scratching his head, the prodigal son gets up, he puts on his clothes, and he makes his way to the kitchen, and there at a small table beside his father. Sit down, son. Thanks for the party, father. I never expected that. And son, we need to go over the list. List. 
yes, he replied, and touched a large pile of blank paper in his hand. We need to make a list of all the money that you spent, all the mistakes you made, all the people that you hurt. We need to write it all down. Well, Dad, I had a plan. I had a whole speech prepared. I had a plan when I was walking home, but when I saw you running towards me, I didn't think I'd need it. And at the party, I forgot what my plan was, the son said, with, with a voice of shame and sorrow that had taken but a brief hiatus during the previous night celebration. He said, well, you've got the rest of your life to, to, for it to come back to you what your plan is going to be to repay me. And he pulls out a plan and writes family inheritance at the top of it. John says, for most of my life, just as how I would have written the second part of the prodigal son story. The director's cut, if you will, an alternative ending that was too harsh for the religious version they released in Scripture. So the father's anxious spread towards the lost son doesn't make any sense. That's not how life works. People pay for their mistakes. They don't get a party for them. And when you return home from wasting your inheritance on the world, your father says, didn't I already bless you? Didn't I already forgive you? John says, I, I don't understand forgiveness. It's always depressing to me when I read a book that tells me that the first step of the Christian walk, believing it, is that God forgives you. Because if I can't get past that first step, that God is forgiving me for everything that I have done, will do, and, and currently doing, then the rest of it, all of it remains completely closed off to me. Not that I don't think that I need forgiveness, it's just that I don't understand how it's possible. If I can't earn it, then it's out of my control and I'm powerless. I remember the first time I ever knew how outrageous and insane real forgiveness was. I got myself into some serious trouble at work. The kind of trouble so big, not only it makes you ashamed that there are people in your life close enough to, to, to get some of the trouble spilled on them. I wanted to push everyone away, to expel people from the planetary system that was me and just float, go float somewhere and die. John says, I called my wife on the phone and told her as much. And I'm, he said, I'm sorry you met me. Uh, I was desperate for her to go to pull away from me so I could inflict pain on only one person myself. And she goes, I love you. She says over the phone. And John says, how can you say that? That doesn't make any sense. This is what the wife says. She goes, you don't get to decide who I love. That's my, I love you. That's my decision. You can't take that away from me. That's my choice. I choose to love you. She repeated words like these over and over and over again. And she attacked me with love that day. Forgiveness I didn't deserve. Forgiveness I couldn't earn or make sense of. I was overwhelmed. Says I have to confess that some days I still think that there's a list that will ask me to work through the day after... God throws me that welcome home party. And I have a hard time understanding how something can be true and so illogical at the same time. And so much of God is that way. But someday when I least expect it in ways that I can't control, I believe a different story about God's forgiveness. This is after the party. It says that the first rays of sunshine crept, crept across a dusty road and, and grated against the eyelids of the prodigal son trying to sleep uncomfortably on the bed of gravel just before the party. His teeth felt dirty, his mouth and hands were stained with the cheap bread, bread, and cheap wine. A long scratch ran across his cheek, a shoe was hanging beneath his head for a pillow. How many times did this make? He thought from the part inside of him that still remembered returning home. He was doing so well. Things were so happy, but it never again always seemed to fail him in the end. How long would he be gone this time? And miles away, a concerned father stood by the front window of the house as a servant approached with a message. Sir, I checked his bedroom in the barn. His things are missing. He's left again. I know. The father shut up with sad eyes and then with slow steps. This is so good. He walked to the large closet and motioned to the servant and says, help me with this welcome home banner. Pulling a pile from, pulling me one from a pile of 10,000. He said, today could be the day that my child returns. See, our job, students, please write this down, does not run out of welcome home banners. 
He doesn't run out. You are welcome in his family. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many times that you've rejected him. It doesn't matter that you're rejecting him. Some of you are rejecting him right now. Whether you're in a place where you're like, you know what? I just like to sin more than I like to pursue God. Let's deal with that. So you say, you know what, well, I've never made a profession of faith where I've never chosen to accept Christ as my Savior, Lord, you've been running. You're either scared to do it or you're waiting for the right moment. Students here, oh, this is the right moment, it's now. If you've never done that before, tonight's the night to do that. So here's exactly what we're going to do. Smarter leaders and band, I'm going I'm to ask everybody to move this time. We're gonna, we're, smarter leaders are going to head to the outside parts of the room. I want to read you a passage of scripture real quick because everybody needs to move it. You don't have to put your stuff up just yet. Students, I want you to stay focused on me. And if you've got a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is where it gets really good because Paul writes here, he says this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling, bringing us to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them as he was committed to us, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore, verse 20, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, Paul writes, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What does that mean for you and I? Run home. Run home. God, God made him who, who had no sin to be sin, talking about Jesus, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That means for you and I, we get a party when we return home because we recognize that we have been forgiven and we have to believe that forgiveness. Because once you believe that forgiveness, then you are saved. Listen, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to bow your hands and close your eyes. Tonight you may be in the middle of a pit. And you feel like it is so deep that you are not going to get out. If people can see how long your list of sins are, oh, there's no way you can get out. Corey Tim Boone says this. She says, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, there are leaders that are around the room right now. Listen, you may be the type of person where you're like, you know what, I'm, 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 I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I know he's my Savior and Lord. But I have left home again. And if you fall into that category, I want you to understand something. God's waiting on you to return home. But listen, if you're the type where you say, you know what, I've rejected my father entirely. And I, and I don't have a relationship with him at all. This next part, this part's for you. If you're saying, you know what, I, I'm tired of being the boss of my life. I'm tired of being the one that calls the shots. Then I, I want to ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Because some of you in this room, you were not saved, and that's okay. That's okay, but I, I, I don't want you to think that you are when you're not. I'm not trying to talk you into anything. I'm not trying to talk you out of anything. But I want you to understand this. This is the most important decision of your life. To allow Jesus to be your Lord and Savior for the rest of your life. To allow him to call the shots. Don't, don't play church. Don't just come to the camps. Don't just come to the events. Don't, don't just allow it to be your mom and your daddy's faith. Don't just open up that Bible. Because if you don't have Jesus in your heart, it's just a book. With a bunch of rules in it. But if you're in a place where you're saying, you know what, I'm going to accept Jesus Christ and I say to you, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And there's nothing special about the words that I'm going to pray. There's nothing special about the, 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 the order of the phrases at all. It's all about your heart. 
I'm just I'm giving you some words to be able to say. So this is you. I'm, I'm going to just pray this. If you're saying, you know what, I want Jesus to give over the Savior. If you're just pray, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I have run from home. But tonight, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. Jesus, come into my life. Restore me. Make me whole. Make me new. Jesus, the best way that I know how I'll turn my back on my sin, I trust you, Lord Jesus, to save me. Listen, if that's you tonight, you want to be really honest about the fact that you do not have Jesus as your Savior, Lord, and yet you are lost, but you want to be saved. And you say, you know what, that, that prayer that I just prayed, that you may just pray that with me, just then, that's, that, that is your way of saying, you know what, I want him to be my Savior, Lord. You're done and running. And it's okay if you don't have all the answers yet. You only need one answer, and that's to, that's to say, I believe that Jesus forgave me down the cross for my sins. The rest is discipleship. So with every hand out, every eye closed, if that's you tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do something. On the count of three, if you pray that prayer, that prayer for the very first time, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to look up at me. Ready? One, two. And you may be afraid to look up right now. There's some people in this room I know you've never, you've never made a decision to follow Christ. And that's okay. I want to be able to find you and see you. Listen, you may say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm a little scared still to look up at you, Josh, but there's, the Lord's doing something in my heart. I'd rather go talk to my small group leader. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song. And they're going to be available to talk to you. They're praying over you right now. And they love you. And they want you to know how much God loves you. So quit playing games. Say, I'm done running. You need to talk to them. They're going to be here. They're going to be available for you. Let's stand and sing.